Poi mi scuso per il ritardo, non era un problema di uh, Trenitalia. Alla fine. Eh, io parlo italiano ma non, non molto bene, dunque ho pensato che anche per voi è un buon esercizio se parlo inglese durante questa uh, presentazione, ma ovviamente sì, per la, per la discussione possiamo farlo in italiano e parlerò lentamente, perché stiamo un po' di ritardo. So you have seen that the main topic of this talk shall be my project Corpus Corporum. You see the address here. I will begin by having a look at the existing digital tools in Greek and Latin studies, especially those that we use often at our own university and seminar, which is in Zurich. Can you hear me at the back? Do you have a microphone? Oh. I'm not very good at shouting, I'm afraid. Can you still not hear me? Avete un microfono? No, no. Okay, I tried to speak as loudly as I can, but uh, maybe there are still some seats in front if you can't hear me at the back. So, you see here, my plan for the presentation today. First, I will present a couple of digital tools that are not our own, but that we use often, so that you can see what exists in uh, Latin and Greek studies uh, for digital tunes, uh, tools. And then I will focus on our own project, the Corpus Corporum, which is a, a Latin meta uh, corpus of uh, full text corpus. So, first, a very brief view on other uh, digital tools that are available in Latin and Greek studies. The very important Pauli uh, Encyclopedia of Classical Studies is available in a digital form at uh, Brill. It's basically just the books that have been scanned. The, the original was in German. Brill has translated it into English, so you can choose here uh, whether you want to read it in English or in German. It's basically just the books, but you can search them. So this is our first tool. Then a tool that we use very often is uh, Brepolis <coughs> by Brepol's publishers in Belgium. Brepolis has a series of uh, different digital tools that are very useful for Latin studies especially. The ones that are most important for us are the Library of Latin Texts, A and B, which are full text corpora, which are therefore doing something similar that we do with our corpus corporum. Besides this, they have a database of Latin dictionaries, which is also very useful. It enables users to search simultaneously in about 20 dictionaries. We can try <coughs> with something respective. You see, they have all these dictionaries digitized, and in these five dictionaries you find the word respective. You can have a look, for example, at the blaze, and you get here the entry in the dictionary. In this case, it's a Latin-French dictionary. Uh, this is very useful, but as you see here, it's, uh, it costs money. Both these tools are not free, and it depends on universities whether they pay the relatively expensive price for these tools or not. Then full text corpora for the Greek language, we have the TLG, the Thesaurus Lingue Greche, which is partly free. It has a TLG Caden in open access. Uh, recently, they decided that they would like to have logins. You can make a free login at TLG and uh, get access to more data. And, but you only get access to the entire amount of data they have if your university is subscribed to the TLG. The tools are very useful, and uh, they have lots of... It's, it's really a really big collection of Greek texts. 
by far the biggest in existence and the search possibilities are quite good. Uh, we have already seen that for Latin, uh, Brepolis does something similar. Maybe we have a quick look at how it looks. Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit less good than uh, the TLG, which is one of the reasons why I started to make uh, this uh, uh, Corpus Corporum uh, at our university. So let's take this one. They make uh, two collections, A and B, the, the, the more technical differences. Collection B usually has older editions that are not the most recent and best critical editions. So you can also just look for a search a word here at full text, for example, and uh, you find that uh, the word respective is found 55 times in 14 authors, and then you can click them. For example, Raimundus Lulus is an author who uses this word a lot. He uses it uh, 20 times. And uh, this, this is basically as far down as you can get. So you can get uh, a few lines of text. You can't really read the text, or it's very laborious to read the text, and that's on purpose because the same publishers want to sell the books. Most of the text, or many of the texts they have in their collection are published in the Corpus Christianorum series. It's these uh, red books, maybe you've seen them already somewhere. They are very expensive but uh, they're usually very good editions of uh, Latin text, and usually the most recent and uh, most critical editions in existence. So you can find here a locus, and the idea is then basically to get the book and read more about uh, the content of the locus you found in the book. So... Um, Then maybe because uh, we don't have terribly much time left, we don't have a look at the PHI, the Packard Humanities Institute Latin Corpus. Uh, this is freely accessible. It's a collection of uh, a collection of uh, antique Latin text, which is quite complete up to the year 200, 200 after Christ, more or less. It's, oh, maybe we have a quick look at it, because uh, you will see that it's rather different than the Corpus Corporum. You get here a list of the authors they have. So let's have a look for Cicero. You can click Cicero. Here you get uh, all his works they have. De Natura Deorum, for example. Then you get the text. You can move within the text here. You cannot download the text as an XML file or something similar, but you can uh, see the text and you can make uh, concordances. So we can again basically look for words in the entire collection in this tool. Then there are now the past 10 years or so, there have been quite a few projects in, at universities in Europe, quite a few of them in Italy. Uh, where Latin texts have been digitized, and usually digitized into the TI XML format, which has become more or less standard format for uh, Latin text. Uh, Latin text. An example is uh, this project, Biblioteca Digitale di Testi Latino Latini Tardo Antichi, which is done at uh, several universities in Piemonte. This is one of the projects that the Corpus Corporum uh, collaborates with, as we, we shall see later on. Then there's an uh, experimental tool, again at Prepolis, that uh, does n-grams. An n-gram is a contiguous sequence of n items, in this case of n words. So, for example, at this tool, you can search several words together. For example, pink in there. This 
tells you how often the combination of these two words, one after the other, occurs in different centuries. You see here that uh, in the 9th century, it, this seems to be most common among texts they have. This tool seems to be freely accessible, but if you would like to see more about the data, you again have to have uh, login uh, credentials from the host. So you can cl click here, my university pays the rather expensive fees, and then you get a list of all the 334 occurrences of pink in the uh, yeah. It's uh, again in the same uh, layout like what we've seen before. A project that is uh, a university project that is not commercial is done by the Lasla in Liège in Belgium. Already in the late 90s, they produced a uh, part of speech annotated corpus of classical Latin texts and published their corpus on a CD-ROM back then called Hyperbase. This uh, CD-ROM had to be uh, bought. It worked on, on Windows XP. I think probably nobody is using Windows XP anymore these days, and so this is legacy software today. But fortunately, it is, uh, has been migrated to an internet tool, which can be freely accessed as, soon, as long as you uh, get uh, credentials from them. You basically just have to send them an email and within a few days you will get uh, login information to the corpus. What you get looks like this. First up here you see the text they have digitized and uh, POS um, tagged. It's quite a large selection of about 150 works from uh, classical antiquity all of them Latin, and in some case, well, in some cases they count them a bit uh, generously. For example, the, the Philippica orations by Cicero, each oration is one work for them. So 150 sounds like a lot, but in reality it's maybe not that terribly much. Uh, I do not know how many words it consists, it's, uh, but it's uh, 19 classical authors are contained in this course. You have quite uh, sophisticated search possibilities. You can, for example, go for a verb, or you can see all the verbs in imperfect, say, second person plural, and then make a search. And you get a list at the bottom. Here, uh, extabatis, advertebatis, esetis, and so on. You can view the context. And, which is especially uh, useful, you can export the entire search data into, uh, into one big text file that can be further processed. So you can copy-paste this out of your browser and do further studies with this. This is a very useful feature. So these are the digital tools for especially Latin studies that I use the most. Certainly there are more of them in existence, but... Uh, these are the ones that I, I use very often, and uh, I mainly show them to show you what the idea about the corpus corporism was about six years ago when we decided to start this project. We noticed that there was no large uh, diachronic Latin text corpus in existence whose data can be seriously searched by linguists or by uh, digital humanities. People. So we started this collection in 2012. The idea was to use Latin text corpora already in existence by partners from usually other universities in Europe, in some cases also from North America, and to make a kind of meta corpus of Latin texts. To have as many Latin texts as possible in order to be able to do a large quantity research on, for example, how words, how often words are used over time and things like that. Our idea was to keep, another idea was to keep this free and open, in contrast to Brepolis, which uh, 
has some of the things we do here, but they use their own format, and uh, uh, normal people don't get access to their data, which makes it, well, <laughs> not very useful for uh, people who do uh, linguistic research. It's very useful, of course, to find a word in, a, in an author, for example, but if you want to get, go be beyond that, it's not very useful. So we wanted to have this free and open. We decided to have the standard TI XML format for our text on the one hand. So on the one hand, a collection of TI XML files with Latin texts. On the other hand, software that uh, loads these texts into a database and uh, enables uh, so different search tools and the like, which I will show you in the second part of this uh, presentation. Uh, to keep the text and the software apart was one of the main ideas was to have high chances of long-term availability, especially of the texts. In the case of a, a project like Brepolis, it's not so clear what's going to happen with the texts in case the uh, Brepolis publishers lose interest in the project or I don't know what, because uh, it is unknown in what format they have their texts. It's nothing standardized as far as I know. So that was the main idea, ideas behind the corpus corporum. Besides, we thought that these Latin texts, most of which are, of course, from antiquity or the Middle Ages or early modern times, should not be hidden behind copyright laws, uh, making it very difficult to do corpus linguistic work on them. And another problem is that tools like Prepolis are not available to universities in many countries, in, for example, Southern Europe, or I've heard from universities in South America who are very glad about Corpus Corporum because they can't afford the very expensive tools from Prepolis. Later on, I will make a, a, a comparison between the Brepolis tools uh, in the Library of Latin Texts and our Corpus Corporum. Uh, you will see that there are, of course, points in which they are better than us, and some points uh, I think we are better than them. But an important point is that our tool is free, uh, freely available on the internet. So, the main features. We are, at present, the largest Latin text corpus in existence with about 156 million words. By, by not much difference, it seems that uh, the Library of Latin Text is around 152 million words at present. So we're about the same size. Then an important feature for reading the text in our tool is that words can be clicked and you can see dictionary entries in several dictionaries uh, for the word you click. This makes reading much faster, especially if your Latin is not very good. Then, of course, we offer the possibilities for queries, including lemmatized queries and complex searches, which I will show you later on. And uh, we provide a direct link to any of the uh, roughly 8,000 texts we have in the collection today. More recently, we added a few new features. We linked the text to bibliographic information about the edition the text is from about the authors, about the texts, uh, especially to uh, the resources uh, VIAF, to which I will come back later, and uh, to Mirabile and DNB and uh, Wikidata. I will show these things later on in, when I present the resource itself. Then we can display entries of critical apparatuses, of course only if they are encoded in the XML file, which unfortunately is usually not the case for the simple reason that it's a lot of work to encode the critical apparatus in XML form. But in principle, we can show them. I will also show examples. Then we can display images. For example, for math books, it's very important to have images. And uh, recently, we uh, added a feature that assesses the edition used, tells you if it's a critical edition, for example, or an old print. It's uh, OCR quality and the richness of the tag set. 
At present, we have 25 copra in the corpus coprum. That's also why it's called corpus coprum, because it consists of a number of uh, single copra. Here in this list, you see some of them. At the uh, main page of our site, you, you see a list of all of them. We are currently adding a 20, 26th corpus. You see at the bottom we have an experimental Greek corpus as, as well, but it's, it's very small. We only have a few uh, texts that were personally important for me uh, included there. And, uh, we do have some uh, Greek dictionaries as well, but it's mostly Latin that we are doing. You see on, on the right-hand side where the texts come from, it's usually by collaboration with universities in uh, Germany, Italy, France, but also countries like Croatia, Canada, or the United States that we have uh, our texts. And you may have spotted already in the Corpus 23, we have text from the University of uh, Pisa, from the Mavrolikos uh, project uh, done here in the house. Among the texts we have, uh, the asterisk is in the wrong place. Uh, the asterisk should, in fact, be at the 8,167, which are the number of texts, but about 200 of these texts are, exist in more than one edition. So if you, that would make a bit less than 8,000 different texts in the collection. You also see that many of the texts come from the Perseus project. And maybe you've also, also already spotted that quite a few of these texts are relatively old editions. For example, the Patrologia Latina is from the 19th century. And in many cases, there are better editions of these texts today, but the collection is still useful, especially because it is so large. Then, as I have told you already, we have uh, Latin dictionaries and, and some Greek dictionaries as well added which can be accessed by click, clicking the words one doesn't understand. Here, a here is a list of the dictionaries we have. We have uh, for classical Latin, we have the most important dictionary, Latin-German, which is the Georgis. One of the most important ones for Latin English, which is the Lewis and Short. The most important one for Latin French is the Gaffio. And the most important one for Latin Russian is the Dvoretsky. Unfortunately, we don't have one for Latin Italian for the simple reason that I have not yet found a text file, an OCR text file of a large Latin Italian dictionary. If any of you have one and it's freely available, I'm very glad to add it. For medieval Latin, we have the old dictionary by Duconche. Duconche is Latin Latin, so you have to be able to understand Latin in order to understand the entries. Then there's uh, Schütz, which is a specialized uh, lexicon for Thomas Aquinas, which is also useful for other scholastic texts, of course. It's specialized on special language used by scholastics. Words like this uh, respective I entered as an example before. Um, then recently we acquired the Bohemorum Lexicon, which is a project from our colleagues in Prague, especially Pavel Niewelt, to which we are very grateful to have uh, the data of the lexicon, which is not yet finished. We only have a part of the alphabet yet of this uh, lexicon. The lexicon gives entries in Czech, but it also gives entries in Latin. So for the, probably quite a lot of people who don't read Czech, it's still usable. For Greek, we have the uh, important Greek, Latin, Greek German dictionary by Pape, and we have the most authoritarian dictionary, Greek English, the LSJ, the Little Scott Jones. The old edition from 1940 is freely available. The more recent edition from 1996 is unfortunately only available to University of Zurich uh, collaborators because it's not freely available. The same is true for the medieval Latin dictionary by Niemeyer which I cannot show to everyone on the internet. We also have the Orbis Latinus by Grese, which is basically a lexicon of place names in Latin. 
which can be also useful. So what kind of searches can be done? We have wildcard searches at the end of a string. So you can start the spelling of a word and end it with an asterisk. Then you have, of course, phrase searches, proximity searches, quorum searches, searches in verse only, which can be interesting to find out, for example, the quantity of a rare Latin word. You can find out how poets used it and in what places in the verse in order to ascertain uh, what syllables are long and short in the word. Then, more interestingly, is uh, uh, we have a lemmatized search, and we'll come back to tree tagger a bit later. And we use the software tree tagger to uh, part of speech tag all our texts, which enables us to do lemmatized searches. So you can search pharaoh and you get all the forms of this verb, for example. Most of our texts have got a time tag as well, so uh, this makes it possible to do time-dependent searches. For example, you can search the word universitas in the 11th century. Or, in fact, from any year to any year that you choose. We decided, in many cases, of course, we don't know the exact year text was written in. But usually we know the life dates of the authors. So, if we do not have the exact data uh, when the text was written, we use the death date of the author, or if that is unknown, his floroid date. So it's not <coughs> completely precise. If you want to look for a word between 1060 and 1065, this will not work well. But for, say, the 11th century, this will work fine enough. And recently we added the possibility to do syntactic searches, for example, uh, pro plus plus uh, a verb in, this, in the supine. Uh, this is a bit slower, we'll show you later on. It's still uh, quite um, experimental. For some corpora we have special features, especially for the Bible corpus we have a feature to see a synoptic Bible in the classical languages, that is in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and in this case we have an English translation. Usually we don't have translations in our corpus, but just the Latin texts. In the case of the Patrologia Latina, we have a special feature that you can jump to a page. So if you know that in volume 67 on column 135a, something is written, but you don't know by whom, you can still find this place, and this locus by this feature. Here you see the amount of text by year. Uh, this is a basic count of words per quarter century. They see that uh, 400 AD, we have more than 12 million, million words in this quarter century, between 400 and 425 uh, AD. The same thing can be done with works per quarter century. Of course, the amount of uh, texts we have is not fully representative of what Latin texts exist. We have uh, more than 150 million words, but uh, Latin is a very rich literature, and there are certainly 10 or 100 times more texts in existence than we have. But it's still interesting to see here some of the peaks. We see that in late antiquity, around 400, there's lots of texts. This can be explained by some of the church authors, especially Augustine and Jerome, Augustinus and Hieronymus, who wrote a lot, and a lot of which is extant. Then we see the so-called Carolingian renewal in the 9th century, which also produced a lot of texts. We see the 12th century, which uh, in many respects was a watershed in the Middle Ages, mm, many new kinds of activities were started in the 12th century, and we also have quite an explosion of literature in the 12th century. That the number of texts goes down after that is artificial and has to do with the Patrologia Latina. The Patrologia Latina basically finishes around 1200. After that, we have 
just le less text, which doesn't mean that less text were written. In the 13th and 14th century, most likely, there were more, even more texts written, and uh, this uh, curve would probably go up all the time, up to at least 1700, when Latin started to fall out of fashion as the most uh, used language for international communication in Europe. So, a brief comparison between the Corpus Corporum and the Library of Latin Texts, as I've told you before. You see, uh, the status is free and open in our case, in their case. I have the information from a, a brochure they sent to libraries every year to sell their products. It's called the Online Databases from 2018. Uh, you see we have one, uh, some 8,200 works at present, and they, if you add the two numbers here, you come also to 8,200 works by coincidence, of course. But 3,500 of these texts they recently acquired from the MGH, the Monumenta Germania Historica, a project uh, that is done in Munich, in Germany, which is freely available. So I'm presently working on formatting these uh, texts into the kind of XML format we need for Corpus Corporum, and they will be added as well to Corpus Corporum. So we hope that by next year we reach uh, 200 million words. Uh, you see, we have critical apparatuses every now and then, that is, if they are included in the data. The Library of Latin Texts does not have this feature. Of course, they have critical apparatuses in their books. So the idea there is basically that you have to consult the book. Uh, you have, I have told you already that our format is TIXML. Text access with us, you will see, is uh, by chapters. You can also download entire texts as text files or XML files, in the future maybe also as PDF files. And a few cases, you can only search them and not access them due to copyright restrictions. Uh, I believe we have more complex searches than the Library of Latin Texts. We have lemmatized searches. They have Similarity search, which is something similar to uh, lemmatized searches, but of course not the same thing. So if you search Ferro with them, you won't find uh, Tuli, for example. And the chronological search is also a feature we both have, but they have eight epochs. So basically you can search in, within some epochs with them, and with us you can search between year A and year B, as you like. Then we have the 13 uh, dictionaries reachable by click. They have a bit more dictionaries than we do, but you can't reach them directly. You have to go from one window to the other to look up a word. <coughs> so, I take it that you know what TIXML is? I don't have to explain. Okay, so maybe very briefly, this is a TIXML file which you probably can't read from behind there. Or maybe I can open one. Uh, bigger and more readable. <clears throat> an XML file is basically just an, uh, a tagged file, similarly like an HTML file, but uh, the tagging is different. It's, XML is wider than HTML. The TI, the Text Encoding Initiative, uh, made an encoding that ha can be used for encoding especially books and other texts. And uh, this, to this format, most people, I would say, today are sticking. Of course, uh, what is allowed and what is not in this uh, TI syntax can be seen on their homepage. But basically, a TI XML file consists of a header. Here you see TI header. And of the text itself. The header contains information, for example, about the author. So information we need for our corpus corporum is an author. If it's anonymous, the author can be called anonymous, which is not a problem, but you need this information. Then you need the title of the work. Uh, in this case, it's in Bonizzo, uh, a historical writer, which is not very known, I think. And his work is called the Liber de Amicum. 
Here are the life dates of this author. And here we encode the VRF link. I will come back to the VRF link a bit later on. It's basically a link that uh, identifies this author uh, unambiguously. There might be more than one person called Bonizzo, but uh, this Bonizzo is the one with this number, basically. This is a worldwide initiative to have fixed numbers for all authors in the history of mankind. It's a very big project, as you can imagine. Then you see here information about uh, the edition that is used. In this case, it's the edition is from the Monumenta Germania Historica, the MGH. Here is a license they added. This all this further information can be here, but it's not absolutely needed for the corpus corporum to load the text. Then we usually add a phrase here at the end that uh, the text was formatted by <coughs> us for the corpus corpus, corpus corporum project, and in what year? This, in this case, I formatted the text in 2018, so it's quite new. And we add a tag uh, about the orthography of the text. This is currently not yet used, but in future the idea is to make possible searches in medieval Latin orthography and classical <coughs> Latin orthography. So you may know that in the Middle Ages, for example, the diphthong, the old diphthong, I could be spelled E, or H's were not written sometimes, things like that. So the medieval search would be more open and uh, find uh, Unusual spellings, let's put it like this. Then the actual text starts with this body tag. You see here basically uh, the text with uh, some tags and titles. The titles are in this diff and head tag. These are also tags that are needed for corpus corporum in order to have a hierarchy of the different parts of the text. And then the rest is basically just text, which can be uh, contain further information like italics, some words that are to be pre printed in italics or in bold or underlined and things like that. And you see the rest of the text, the file is basically just text. And then it ends, uh, end of body, end of text, end of TI. So this is a TI file. That's the kind of files we need for corpus corporum. The back end of the Corpus Corporum is basically a virtual Ubuntu server at University of Zurich, which has currently got 150 gigabytes of space. About 85% of them are full. Uh, the texts are loaded into a MySQL database, which is the standard procedure to work with large amounts of textual data. The um, online uh, browser view you get is made by Apache HTTP server. The programming between um, the searches and the, the online presentation and the database is done in the programming language PHP. Uh, we have a web interface to load new texts, which is, of course, not accessible to people who are not me, which looks like this. So here I can add a new dictionary. I have to load it onto the server first <coughs> by, uh, by FileZilla or by SSH. Then it appears here, and I can click it, and it gets loaded. The, dictionaries, the dictionary format is basically a very primitive format. It's one line is one entry. So you get first the word, ferro, for example, then you need two spaces, and then comes all the rest. All the rest may contain HTML tags, for example, for bold text. Then at the bottom, I can choose the corpora. Here you see the 26 corpora we have at present, for example, Corpus Mathematica. Then you see all the text, the XML files that are on the server at present, for example, you get here the text by Maurolikos that I already have from you as an XML file, the Arithmeticorum Libri Duo. If I click here, it gets loaded onto the server. It is already loaded onto the server, so I don't do this now. 
you can also just reload the header, for example, if there's a misspelling in the title and you don't want to load all the, I don't know, 10 million words or something afresh. Here you can also tell uh, the av availability. So, for example, if this text was copyright protected, I could here add tag and it wouldn't be visible to everybody in, on the internet, but it would still be searchable. So, protected texts can still be searched by our site and you get a snippet view of the found results. Then you have to find a way to get the book or the resource where we have text from. For the part of speech tagging, we use a tree tagger, which is a free software that is developed uh, in Stuttgart and is available. Uh, it basically tags sentences. Now here's an example. The tree tagger is easy to use, is the example. Uh, it gets lemmatized, which, well, in, in English, lemmatizing is quite simple. It's basically the is becomes a b, and all the rest is the same. In Latin or in other more inflectional languages, it's not so simple. And you get the part of speech. Uh, the the uh, abbreviations for the parts of speech depend. So our abbreviations are different from the ones you see here. With us, for example, a V would stand for a verb, but not a B, B as in this case. Yes, please, sir. And did you have to, did you have to, did you have to train the tree tag here, or it was already trained with a... Okay. Yeah, I, I come to this point right now. We didn't train it ourselves, uh, but maybe we should in the future. We have the text data from Gabriele Brandolini, which is available here on the site. There's, recently, there's another Latin data, also on the site from the Index Tomisticum Tree Bank by Marco Passarotti, uh, both of them done by Italians, by coincidence. Uh, we are now currently testing this uh, uh, data from Passarotti, but it is not yet introduced. Up to now, we have worked with the Brandolini text uh, uh, samples. The problem is they are made on a relatively small sample of Latin texts and they are not extremely good. So there are mistakes to be expected. It's certainly something in the future that could be improved to have better data for the tree tagger. For the search engine, uh, we started off with a normal search in MySQL, which becomes very slow after you have a few dozen million words. So we changed to the Sphinx search engine, which is uh, open source and very fast. Some of the searches are not yet on Sphinx. You, you will notice immediately if you use the Corpus Corporum, uh, these are the ones that take very long. So the ones that are reasonably, reasonably fast are done by Sphinx software now. So you see all of this software is uh, free and open. Here you see some user statistics for, uh, from the past five years. You see that uh, they are rising. Currently, we're around slightly more than 300 individual non-bot users per day, which for Latin texts is quite high, I believe, and it is rising. It is interesting to note in this graph that you can see the summer break very well. People seem to work much less in Ferrovosto. Here is a summer break, here is another summer break. Can you see my mouse? Here is another one. Uh, one has passed now, so we hope that uh, the, the numbers will increase now in the next month or so. Um. So, now, brief live demonstration. I'll show you a few examples of what you can do. Uh, with the things I've told you right now. Uh, I've already told you there's a direct link for every text. So, of course, you can start at the main page, but you can also start with a direct link. So, for example, this direct link should lead us to a text by Lambertus de Monte, which I happen to know well because I edited it myself. It's a very little-known author from the late 15th century who wrote a text about the salvation of Aristotle. So you see here that the information that was in the TI file header goes here. You have here the author, his life date. We, we don't know when he was born. We know that he, was, uh, that he died in 1498. 
the, type, the title of the text, the editor, which is me, uh, the book in which it was edited, and uh, the city, and the uh, publisher house, publishing house, which is winter in this case, and the year, 2014. Here you also see that it's a critical edition and the critical apparatus is encoded. To be honest, it's not a very critical edition because basically you have one print and one uh, hand copy from the print. So it's not a text that was very successful, in other words. But that's all there is about this text. You see here the direct link with which you can go directly to this text, and the orthography. In this case, we have medieval Latin orthography. Here you see the incipit of the text, the number of words in the text, the number of distinct words in the text, the XML file, the text file, and these two things you don't see if you're not me, because they're not yet publicly available. The annotated file would be an annotated XML file with a part of speech annotation, but it's still too messy to have uh, everybody see this. And also the PDF doesn't yet work the way it should. So, but maybe we go back to the beginning. This is the start page, and we could reach the text we have now reached by choosing one of the corpora. In this case, the corpus is in the, corp uh, the, the text by Lambertus is in the corpus auctoris scientiarum uh, Avarii. So you see here a list of the authors in this corpus, and here again you see the list with number of words and works, and uh, this can be uh, ordered alphabetically or by number of words. So we can go to Lambertus, then you, we get a list of the text we have by this author, which in this case is only one text, and here we get further information about the author, which is basically a collection of links. The VOF link I told you before, I told you of before, is um, clickable. The VOF is a virtual international authorization uh, file, authority file, which gives you, every author has a number, and the Lambertus has this number, and it tells you life dates. I came to the conclusion that we don't know when he was born. They think that he was born around 1430. It's just different opinions. And then further down on the page, you see links to libraries and library catalogs and some of the works known by this author. The, the work I edit is it's this one, the Questio de Salvazione Aristoteles. Uh, this is a mistake. It should be Aristoteles, not Aristoteles. <coughs> Then you get uh, alternate ni name forms from the Deutsche Nat Nationalbibliothek. Uh, our author can also be called Lambertus de Herrenberg. So the Monte is basically a Latinization of this uh, Herrenberg, or Monte Domini. You can also go directly to the entry in the Deutsche Nationalbibliothek. And we have here the data they have about his life. Uh, these data can change, uh, can be a slightly different between what we have and what they have. One has to live with that. Then we have a link to Mirabile. Mirabile is a large project by Sismel Firenze. Uh, yes, go away. Which basically, in this, which contains many things, what the thing we link to is basically lists of uh, works that an author has written and the manuscripts there are that are known for these works. So we have here Lambertus de Monte, and in, in fact, you see here that he, he has written other texts than the one I edited, but they are not yet edited, to my knowledge. So I think this is my text. Yes, this is my text, and they also have the edition here. You have an incipit, and uh, they tell you about these manuscripts, which uh, what happens if you well, you don't get much more. You get information about uh, the age of the manuscript, which is 15th century in this case. So then you can click the text, and you're there again where uh, we started this uh, 
presentation of uh, the live presentation. In order to read the text, you can go to, let's go to paragraph 3, for example, then 3.1, 3.1.1. It's very scholastic, so it has lots of uh, subheadings. And then you get text here. The, the blue text is a, uh, a quotation. You see here, by clicking the footnote, you see where the quotation comes from. It comes from Nicolas de Lira, in this case, plus some comment of mine from the edition, which in this case happens to be in German, because the edition was done in German. Uh, now, when you read the text and don't understand the word, you can click it. Let's click Expositio. Then down here you get the dictionary entries. Let us have a look at Lewis and Short. Uh, for important words, of course, the space is not enough here, so you have to click Show Full Text. Then you see Expositio, an exposing of an infant, uh, a setting forth or a definition explanation of the meanings that uh, Lewis and Short give for this word. And uh, these are the other dictionaries I mentioned before. Of course, they only figure here if they have the word. So we don't usually have all 13 dictionaries, but only those that uh, have the word. Maybe we can have a look at some other corpora. Uh, recently uh, concluded a collaboration with the ALIM project, which is run by several Italian universities, the Latinità Italiana del Medioevo. You see here the people that um, uh, collaborated in this project, and they have uh, digitized several hundred Latin texts and charters. Uh, we don't have the charters, we have only, uh, uh, how should I call that? book texts, so to speak. You see here a list of the, of the authors. For example, by Dante, of course it's uh, Latin works only, not his, his Italian works. Yeah, for example, uh, the De Vulgari Eloquentia. So you see here again the, the edition, which is in this case an edition from 1968. You can go into the text the same way as I showed you before. And then quick words and so on. Now, as the time is advancing, let's have a look at some searches. I've already tested this. For example, you can search the phrase ad mentis obtutum in the entire collection. The idea is that you always search down here in the left hand bottom frame and you always search where you are. So if you are at the level of, say, author Lambertus de Monte on search, then you search only within this text. <coughs> if you search on the start page, you search everything. And you can also do a dictionary display. Of course, this works only for one word and not for something like mentis obtutum, but you could enter mentis and you will get the entry for mens in this case. This is done by Sphinx. So you see, this was extremely fast. It, it searched 156 million words in two seconds or so. You see that this uh, uh, phrase exists in seven texts we have in Corpus Corporum. So in fact, you also see that uh, these texts are the same. So we have here an example of texts that we have several times. We have the Epistles by St. Augustine in the uh, CSEL edition, which is more recent, and in the Patrologia Latina edition. And Augustine uses this phrase twice, in, twi in two, uh, in fact, in the same epistle, but uh, at different uh, loci within it. And then it's uh, used once by Bede, once by Rabanus, uh, twice by Rabanus Maurus. Maybe by quoting St. Augustine, but this is a question that a philologist working on this will have to ask himself. Uh, for the more complicated queries, you best have a look at the uh, help. Help is here, it's a bit hidden, and it's clickable. You get a list of the kind of searches and the syntax you have to use to do searches. I'll show you some examples, you can read this when and if you use the tool yourself. So we can do something like, uh, 
up over here. Uh, I think this is the correct thing. Syntax. So I want something like privatio and morse with a distance of maximum five words between the two bins. Uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, it works. So we get things like privationem que mors vocatur by St. Augustine and some other, we have 30, 30 hits in this case. But we can also do this, uh, we can also do lemmatized searches. So for example, if we want to search uh, privatio in a lemmatized way, we can do it like this. This possibly takes a bit longer It's, well, it's 3,979 hits, so I think it's still reasonably, reasonably fast, maybe 10 seconds or so. We got uh, privazione, privat, privatio, privationem, and all the other forms of uh, privatio. Of course, in this case, you could have just done uh, privati and asterisk, but in the case of uh, um, Ferro, for example, that it makes little sense to search Ferro because I get a million hits. So maybe let us go to a text first. We can go say to this is the. You always see at the beginning of a corpus where the texts come from, and usually with a, a link to their page. So this is a corpus that comes from the Perseus uh, digital library. You can click it and go get to their page. For example, let us see Vitruvius, an author on uh, architecture in classical Rome. We can search here, ferro, lemmatized. Let's see how often we find it, 34 times. And of course, we find now words like tulit, which is the uh, perfect tense of ferro as well. We can also, something quite new is the uh, parts of speech search. Let us see if it functions. I'm not absolutely sure that it does. <coughs> so we can search something like uh, D plus a gerund following it. The, the R1 means it has to follow with a distance of one word maximum and on the right hand side. So not gerund plus D, D, but something like D faciendo. But this doesn't run on Sphinx, so it's slow. I try it now with a text by Aulus Gellius, uh, an author from the second century AD. It's a relatively large text of more than 100,000 words. So let's see how long this takes. Or maybe I'll show you something else in the meantime. And we see here, we can have a look at. Uh, the tab, and, and we will hopefully see when something happens. So we hope that uh, we're quite sure that this is going to be faster in the future, but it, it isn't yet. We have another feature here at the, on the top page. Of course, there may be authors in more than one corpus. We have text by Cicero in several corpora, for example. So you can search an author or a text name here. You can search Cicero. Then you get a list. One of his texts is in Corpus 4, most of his texts are in Corpus 5. And then you can click them and you get directly to the text. Uh, I'm afraid it's getting slow a bit now. Yeah. So uh, I finish this by showing you some examples of um, pictures. Uh, the classical texts usually don't have t pictures because uh, we don't uh, have them extant. But for example, for mathematical texts, pictures are very important. We have here a text by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, Nova Methodus Pro Maximis and Minimis. And quite at, uh, we have here a result. So we found something like uh, De Moderando, De Constituendo, De Necando, De Loquendi. This is not, well, yeah, it's okay, but it's a different case. So we found uh, 
nine hits in this 100,000 word text in, in one minute or so. It works, but it's not fast. And here, back to Leibniz, Leibniz has a pictures. The pictures are hidden behind this camera symbol. So you click on it, you see here the picture, you can make it larger. You see here the picture of his uh, uh, construction of a calculus that takes it about infinitesimal calculus. I can show you now an example of time dependent search. Um, respective was the word we had already before. We can search it between the word the year zero and the year 1000. This is a scholastic word. We would expect it, but maybe it doesn't exist until the word one, uh, the, the year 1000. It may only exist in the 12th or 13th century. But we can have a look. We do find it several times, and uh, I think I believe these are all in the Patrologia Latina, and these may all be dated wrong. But uh, the philologist will have to have a closer look at this. I'll show you this, so you shouldn't have too much uh, confidence in the data. You have to. Always, like always with digital tools, you have to think about what you get. So, for example, this Beda Incertus here is, has the life date of Beda, which is certainly wrong. This text is probably 12th century or 13th century, but we do not have this in our database because I didn't find any information about this text. It's just, I think that it's probably 12th or 13th century, but uh, I don't know. And here you have a text, Benedictus Nursia, the Benedict, St. Benedict's rule, and it may well be that this text comes from the introduction written by the modern editor in Latin. So you really have to click and, and check in such cases. Good, let's have a quick look at what we're planning for the future. You've already seen that uh, two of the things that are necessary to do in the future is that it has to become faster, at least some of the searches have to become faster. And also the, food, the entire in interface should become faster. If many people are online, it can get rather slow. And there are mistakes, especially uh, mistakes in the dating of texts, as the one, as the example I've showed you with the last example, for example. Uh, then we're loading new texts. I've mentioned already the uh, digital MGH, which I'm currently working on. About 100 of the 3,000 texts are already loaded. We continue collaboration with other projects. We have recently finished uh, with Alim, and we are now uh, working with the Edizioni del Galuzzo from Florence. To have the, the <coughs> paper editions are going to be retro digitized, and uh, they uh, would like to collaborate with us and have the texts uh, available on Corpus Corsum. Then another thing I've mentioned already is that medieval spelling, we would like to be able to search, for example, in one search, find things like hiems and hiems, which are both different spellings of the same word for winter in Latin. Hiems would be the classical spelling, and something like huems is what you may very well find in medieval uh, editions of texts. Then we're also working on a feature to have a lemma first attested per author. We're working on a feature to cross-link in case we have more than one edition. At present, I have a list of 182 works that we have in more than one edition. Most of them two editions, uh, very few of them in three different editions. For the further future, we have uh, plans to find automatically uh, quotations from earlier texts and mark them in color. So if a certain number of words after one another, say five words, exist in the same form already in an earlier text, the text will turn, say, green. And if you click on the green color, you would see uh, who used this phrase before. But this is not yet done. And there are some more features you see here on the slide that uh, we are thinking about presently. In the long term, we think uh, our plan will be to publish our software on something like GitHub so that people or interested parties, also universities, could set up their own online or offline corpora. The software works on, only on Linux, of 
course, we won't develop Windows or Apple software. Uh, also, the freely available TI text will be made available as full corpus downloads, but this may be in the more distant future. And uh, this, we are advancing relatively slowly lately, which is uh, the reason of which is basically that we have run out of funding in the year 2015. We were funded between 2012 and 2015 by the Swiss government through the EU Cost Action IS 1005, in which we started the project, and uh, since then we've more or less worked as a hobby project on this. And we are basically myself and uh, my colleague Jan Stibor at the University of Prague, and occasionally Max Benziger, who worked for us in the first three years of the project. So this is why we're relatively Slow. Exactly. Exactly. So, exactly. Right now we come to. And I'm on a discussion.